Good morning. Labour have suffered heavy losses in the council elections in England and Wales. Both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats have made gains at Labour's expense. The Home Secretary, David Blunkett, says he is mortified by his party's performance, with half the results declared so far. Let's take a look at some of the numbers. So, councillors, first of all, let's have a look at who's up and who's down. The figures there coming in. As you can see, Labour currently down 211, the Tories up 102, and Lib Dems up 66. So, both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats are claiming bigger advances there and Labour acknowledging, as we heard in the words of David Blunkett, mortification, but according to David Blunkett, not meltdown. And uh, Tessa Jow was saying earlier, acknowledging a strong protest vote. Let's have a look now at the councils, how the councils themselves uh, pan out. This is the big picture. Labour down seven councils, the Conservatives up six, and the Lib Dems overall, despite uh, more councillors, they are down in terms of actual overall councils that they control. Um, they're down to five, down, they've lost two overall. Um, you can see, obviously, at the bottom there, uh, there's quite a few, more than four more now in no overall control. So that is the big picture. Now, Phil. The latest BBC projection, which is based on more than 600,000 votes cast in 300 key wards, suggests that the Conservatives would have 38% of the vote. Charles Kennedy's Liberal Democrats would gain 30% of the vote. Labour, 26%. The first time that a party in power at Westminster has come third in the local elections. The smaller parties, such as the Greens and the UK Independence Party, are predicted to get a total... 40%. Our chief political correspondent, Gitto Harry, is at Westminster. Gitto. Phil, the voting's all over, as we know, but we're not even halfway through the results. European elections, we have to wait till Sunday. London elections, we have to wait till this afternoon. There are still quite a few councils to come back. But from the initial picture, as you've spelt it out, a very bad night for Labour and some consolation prizes. Plenty of uh, good news, if you like, for the Tories and for the Liberal Democrats, though a few warning signs for both as well. Polly Billington looks back on the night. Trafford is Tory once more. Once it was a shining example of Conservative rule in a northern city, but it fell to Labour during the 90s. Getting it back suggests the Tories can make headway in urban areas in the north. It could be that Labour falls into third place across the country, which heartens the Tories. There's a 12 point lead now, Conservatives over Labour. The last time we had a, a lead in 1992, we had an eight point lead. I think nobody could argue now that we're not winning with a really good chance of winning that next general election. Claiming back natural territory like Brentwood in Essex cheered Conservatives too. But it could be the party's share of the vote is no greater than under William Hague in 2000, and we all know what happened to him. But Labour lost out in heartland areas like Burnley and St Helens. Ministers recognise it's not been a good set of results for Labour. I'm mortified that uh, we're not doing better than we have done. We know it's been a bad night, but we're obviously going to have to present the facts as they are. So, yeah, a very a, a bad night for us, but not meltdown. No takeoff for the Conservatives. They haven't even got the undercarriage down, never mind uh, managed to actually get across the, uh, across the Atlantic or, or, dare I say it, the English Channel. But Iraq has clearly been a factor, and certainly one the Liberal Democrats have made the most of as they won seats from Labour. In the South, though, the Liberal Democrats lost out to the Conservatives. This doesn't bode well for their chances of increasing the number of MPs, but they're still upbeat. The next general election, I think, is going to be much more now a three-way national contest, with us having challenged and seen off the Conservatives in many parts of the South and the West, we're now taking the fight to Labour and beating them in their heartlands in the North. What MPs want to know from these results is what it all means for them. Will they get re-elected to come back here if there's a general election next year? Who will end up running the country? Now, these local election results do not look good for Labour, but there's still a lot more work to do for the Conservatives before Michael Howard can book those furniture removal men to move him into number 10. Polly Billington, BBC News, Westminster.
The joy on this occasion is that they were not once again talking about some boring, predictable tale of uh, fallen turnout. There are really interesting things to look at here, and the turnout, incidentally, is higher. The results are interesting not just for the main parties, but for a whole load of other parties who are competing, especially in the European elections, but also locally. Tim Wilcox now report on what happened to them. While the big parties battle it out over the first three places, some of the smaller ones are today quietly enjoying their own electoral successes. The Greens, seen here celebrating in Oxford, are already eight seats up nationally on their last result. Brilliant. Oh, well done. And the UK Independence Party, which is predicted to do well when the Euro votes are counted on Sunday, has also made two gains, its candidate in Hull taking his seat from an independent. But perceived as a single-issue party, wasn't this just a protest vote? It's not just a protest vote. People are absolutely fed up with Europe. They know we've got policies on everything, not just Europe. And this is why they're giving us our, their support. In Wales, Plaid Cymru's been hoovering up more seats. They're up nine so far, including inroads into Ceredigion. We've also made some interesting gains in places like Newport, Cardiff and Swansea, which we're overjoyed about. They might be small gains, but they are they do show the start of a breakthrough in the cities for Plaid Cymru, which is something that's vitally important for us. But there's been a reversal of fortune for the BNP in Burnley. Its share of the vote there has dropped by 10% and it made no breakthrough in Pendle. Voters' anger with the government hasn't filtered down to all the smaller parties. Tim Wilcox, BBC News. What's wonderful on these occasions is watching government ministers trying to put the gloss on what's happened. Some of them, of course, call a spade a spade. Uh, David Blunkett, as we heard, said he was mortified at what had happened to Labour. Could uh, his other cabinet colleagues bring themselves to say that? Well, we caught up with John Reid, the health secretary, this morning. This is what he said. Uh, Dr Reid, are uh, you mortified by last night's results? No, I don't think last night's results are particularly good for anybody. I mean, obviously, they aren't good for us. But uh, any hopes of a Conservative big breakthrough have obviously now been laid to rest for a while. Um, and I suppose the smaller parties take some satisfaction out of it. No, I don't think they're, they're great results for anybody. Now, they don't particularly indicate much at all, I think, about a prospective general election. But you can't, you can't disagree, you've come third. It's the worst result for a governing party in memory. I don't think the results are particularly good for anyone. Um, we're mid-term. We obviously uh, have had, in the last year, a problem with Iraq, although it looks as though uh, people are beginning to see some of the advances made there. On the other hand, the Conservatives certainly haven't made any big breakthrough. Indeed, the campaign's been a disaster for them on every tactical issue. Michael Howard has illustrated that he's not fit to be Prime Minister. And in terms of the share of the vote and seats and momentum, they aren't breaking through. So I, I don't think it changes a lot. Somehow I didn't think that Dr John Reid, the sort of hard man of the Cabinet, could ever bring himself to say that he was mortified. What about my guest, a very senior Labour MP and a, a gentle one at that, Donald Anderson. Um, are you mortified as what has happened, not least in your own backyard, Swansea, well, where you've lost control? mortified. You're talking to a soldier who's just returned from one corner of the battlefield and asking him to comment on the battle as a whole, when, frankly, the, the clouds are... The smoke is still there. We, there are still some results coming out in Wales and uh, not too bad for the Labour Party in the valleys. But it is, of course, it's a bad result for Labour. It's not disastrous, but it's bad. We've been here before, we've bounced back, and we'll bounce back again. And that's partly what democracy is about. It keeps people on their toes if uh, there is a protest like this. A joy of it is a day for us lot rather than you lot at that time. It reminds you of your... Uh, reliance upon the rest of us. But uh, Tony Blair said that one thing that had cast a cloud over all of this was Iraq. Now, you, of course, are the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. You understand these issues better than most of your colleagues. Do you think it cast a cloud? And is that what meant that you did take a bit of a hammering last night? Difficult to tell. I, I've been actually on doorsteps for a number of days. I don't think anyone actually raised Iraq with me directly, but of course, the Tory press did. Donald, I'm sorry, we have to stop you there. We've got a live result. We'll hand back straight to the studio. Indeed, Gitto, thank you. We're going live to Newcastle. Some re results are being declared. Our uh, correspondent there is Mark Denton. What's happened so far, Mark? Yes, she'll come to us as the first result is being declared here in Newcastle this afternoon, this morning rather, for the Ousburn Ward. And what I can say is that direction is going on now, as you can see there. 
first declaration of the day here in Newcastle. What has happened in the last um, sort of hour since you came to us is that there is a discernible change of mood, particularly amongst the Labour Party here. Very, very worried expressions. Now, bear in mind that the Liberal Democrats are targeting specifically the council leader Tony Flynn's ward at this election. That hasn't been announced yet, but very, very worried expressions for Labour. Bear in mind this has been a Labour council since 1974. This is traditionally rock solid Labour territory. But there are certainly growing hopes here today, I think it's fair to say, from the Liberal Democrats that they can not only make inroads here, but they can also potentially take control of this key North East Council. What's the problem for Labour? Is it Iraq? Well, I think there's twofold. Um, there's a problem and there's also a, a, a logistical issue as well. The problem, certainly Iraq. The message we're getting through, certainly from, from Labour and indeed from, certainly from Liberal Democrat campaigners, is that on the streets of Newcastle, in some of the most traditional um, Labour wards, that uh, issue of the Iraq war is not playing well with traditional Labour supporters and they're going to other parties. The other key issue is there's been a restructuring of this whole city in terms of the wards. Now, it sounds very academic, but what it actually means is that there are now more wards in the suburbs of Newcastle, more typical territory for the Liberal Democrats, rather than in the old part of the city, more typical territory for Labour. That is giving the Liberal Democrats real hope, and it's an almost palpable feeling here at the Civic Centre. You can feel the Lib Dems' confidence grow by the minute. Well, we'll be back with you, Mark, when the results do start coming in. But for the moment, let's go back to Gitto at Parliament. Yeah, interestingly, on that Newcastle issue, first of all, the Lib Dems I speak to here in London were telling me last night that Newcastle was looking very promising. So really watch that space. But I must say, it feels like there's a bit of a conspiracy there to declare that just when I was putting Donald Anderson on the spot, pointing out that in your own backyard, Swansea, uh, Labour actually lost control. And this is an example of this backlash against the government. Now, you were about to say how much of this you think is down to the Iraq war or not. Not directly. I mean, genuinely, no one mentioned Iraq to me, so far as I can recall. I think it had an indirect effect in terms of trust and confidence. Why people don't trust Tony Blair anymore? Well, it was in chipping away at that trust. I think that as things move, for example, on the new Security Council resolution, there is a reasonable chance that that will go off the headlines by the time we come to the next election. And remember that in 2000, everyone, William Hague and all these people, were exulting at the tremendous result for the Tories then. A year later, they were uh, gloomy. And this could happen. There won't be an election for perhaps a year, a year or so. And uh, local elections are protest votes. General elections are very different. Well, Caroline Spellman, the senior Tory, was standing where you're standing now, more or less. I can still see the indent of her feet in the grass <laughs> um, about an hour ago. And uh, she was telling us it's different now, because back then she acknowledged that they'd gone on to have a hammering. But she said then people still thought, this new bunch, these Labour guys, they deserve another chance at the reins in Downing Street. This time they won't because that trust thing, as you yourself acknowledge, has gone. It hasn't gone. It's been chipped away. And uh, clearly when people come to the general election, they will vote on very different issues. And what is clear, in the, so far as we can tell, the dust has not yet settled on the local elections. But in some areas, the Liberals have done well. In other areas, the Conservatives have done well. And that is, in some ways, uh, encouraging for us that we can build on, as we did from 2000 to 2001. You've been in politics a long time. You know that you have never done this badly in local elections, and you also know that it does have a knock-on effect, isn't it? It's not just about councils, it's about how your troops feel on the ground, and there's nothing more humiliating and demoralising than to suffer the kind of results that you had overnight last night. That will have an effect, won't it, next it year? It will have an effect on morale, but whereas the Conservatives have basically ignored their grassroots during the years of Mrs Thatcher, I believe that we've worked very closely with our local councils. We still have a very good foundation. We haven't, we've learned from the Tory mistakes. And that foundation will allow us, in my judgment, to be well poised to come back, be it next year or the year after, when the general election comes. Donald, I know some of your colleagues would beg to differ on that, but I'll uh, allow you to make that point, of course, because that's what we do here. And as uh, you can hear the bells of uh, Big Ben in the background, I'll hand over back to you in the studio. Thank you, Gitto. Uh, check on the headlines now, quarter past 11. Labour has recorded its worst local election result in living memory. David Blunkett admits he's mortified by the outcome. The Conservatives have made significant gains. The party chairman welcomes their improved results in urban areas. 
The Liberal Democrats have at least matched their best performance, although they were pushed hard by the Tories in some areas. And in sport, John Terry trains with England. He takes part in the warm-up as he bids to be fit for England's opening Euro 2004 game against France on Sunday. New Zealand begin to sag as Martin Saggers tempts Jacob Oram into providing Andrew Strauss there with a simple catch, the Kiwis 308 for five at Trent Bridge. And ahead of this weekend's Canadian Grand Prix, Ralph Schumacher says his elder brother Michael's success has made the sport boring. Explain why at 11.45, see you then. Thanks, Mike. Well, all the uh, results here first on News 24. Do stay with us. We're all over the country with our correspondents. Uh, first, let's anal analyse some of the results we've seen coming in over the few last few hours. Key results. Uh, we're joined by Tony Travers, election analyst from the London School of Economics. Tony, thanks for coming back on. Let's have a look first at uh, Rossendale, because it's an important uh, Tory gain and one of the, those gains that they've been drawing a lot of attention to. Uh, so I think we can see that result now. What did you, what did you make of that? I think they're up. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Oh, yes, they, they're up. Um, to 25. I'll tell you, right, you've got mm. the Conservatives up eight there, Labour down eight. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Conservatives really want to see, a straight switch from the Labour Party to the Conservatives. And that is, you know, what they would like to see going on all over the country. And if there were more of that kind of thing, they'd really be whooping for yeah, joy. Yeah, because I was looking through this, and it's really interesting to see where they're making their gains. Because all, in almost every case, it's conservative gain from a situation of no overall control, as opposed yeah. to direct conservative gains from Labour. Absolutely. And this is a, a very good example of what they'd like to see more of and where they, I mean, here they've gained control. Uh, but, you know, what they really want is to be able to switch straight from Labour to Conservative control and that, you know, that's the acme of what they're yes. looking for. Well, let's have a look at Oxford now because that is a case of what they don't really want happening. Here we, <laughs> we see Labour losing. Uh, they lost nine, down to 20, so they've, lo they've lost overall control. But instead of going Tory, it's gone to no well, overall control. We've seen a fragmentation. Fascinating result, Oxford. I mean, you know, one has to say with... Uh, all due love and affection to the people of Oxford. They're an unusual group by the standards of British voters, highly educated, uh, but, I mean, not that other, other voters aren't, don't get me wrong. Uh, and what you see here is Labour losing, I suspect, quite a lot of anti-Iraq in a place like Oxford. Lib Dems winning, Greens doing well there. The Greens have always been strong, or recently been strong in Oxford and others as well. So. And in Oxford, I mean, Oxford's a rich city. No Conservatives there at all. Amazing kind of result. And that would be very depressing for the Tories. They need to win in places like Oxford. Yes. Now, let's have a look at um, Stoke, because here's another example. And uh, let's see what has been happening there uh, this morning and overnight. Labour. Yeah, well, this is, this, is a, this is a quirk. And, I mean, uh, it's the reason I think we want to look at just one or two of these is these are local elections. And the great joy of local elections is you do get things that are not, you know, in line with the great national swing. It's easy to treat these things as opinion polls for the country. Here we've got Labour up five, Conservatives no gain, Lib Dems down one and others. Now there's clearly a kind of switch between a group of uh, non-party or other candidates to Labour, but even so, you, you, you get these quirks, and it's just worth reminding ourselves that these are local elections and local factors work. There's a directly elected mayor in possibly evidence of reasonable popularity for a Labour mayor there. So, Tony, you've had a, a few hours now to digest what's, what's going on. What is your sense of the big headlines to draw out of this morning's experience? I think the big headlines, and we're still really dealing with the overnight results here, we're just waiting for the flood for this morning, but from overnight, the, the picture is, is clear. Very bad for Labour. They're going to come third in terms of share of the vote. Good results for the Conservatives, good results for the Liberal Democrats, but in a sense it would have been better for both of them if the other hadn't done reasonably well uh, as well. So those are the key headlines, but we're now really waiting for the big cities outside London and then this afternoon to see what happens to Ken Livingstone in the capital. Tony, thanks very much. Come back and talk to us after we see Newcastle and those other big cities. Thank you. Thanks. No, a result just coming in, not a big city. It's West Yorkshire, though, a partly urban area. It's Craven. And there you can see uh, the Conservatives on 13, up 2, the Lib Dem 6, down 2, and other parties on 11.
Now, Peter Lane is in Birmingham, one of the largest metropolitan councils. It was held by Labour but slipped into no overall control last year. Set the scene a bit more for us, Peter. Yes, of course, a very big council here, an annual budget of £2 billion, a population of around a million people in Birmingham itself. We're right in the uh, city centre here at the National Indoor Arena. The counting well underway behind me, the entire floor area here given over to the uh, trestle tables and boxes. They started counting here a little early. We were expecting it to begin at 9.30, but they began at 9 o'clock, and we're hoping to get the first declaration shortly after midday. Things have changed here slightly in that um, there's one new ward, and a lot of boundaries have been changed around the city, so there are, in fact, 120 seats up for grabs here. As you say, Labour lost uh, their majority, but they're still the predominant force in politics here and have been for the past 20 years. But there is an assumption in this part of the country with a large Muslim population that perhaps people will almost forget that these are local elections and try to use their vote as almost a protest vote, look at the bigger picture, the global picture, and that the anti-war sentiment may have a bearing on the results here, and that could be to the Liberal Democrats' advantage. We haven't had automatic postal voting here. It's been the the old-fashioned method, going down to your polling station using the ballot box, although so there has, of course, been some postal voting here. And here, like in many other parts of the country, there have been allegations that that system is being abused. And West Midlands Police, their economic crime unit, are confirming today that they've been asked to certainly investigate allegations, but they say that they are simply allegations at this stage. For example, there are reports that... Um, postal votes for 16 different people. The forms were all diverted and sent to one house. Now, that in itself isn't illegal. These forms can be passed on to different houses, but the police would say that that is, in theory, suspicious. We've also heard rumours that some postmen have been offered money in the street to hand over the bag of forms that they're carrying. So the uh, economic unit, as I say, is West Midlands Police looking into that. Everybody here waiting to see what the main uh, set of results will be. So you're suggesting, Peter, that the vote is pretty good at lateral thinking. When they vote in a local election, they don't just think of council tax and emptying the bins and all the rest of it. No, exactly. And Birmingham's interesting because, in theory, there should be a feel-good factor in this city. It only just lost out to the Capital of Culture bid. There's been a huge level of investment over the past few years here. Of course, uh, the Bull Ring has just reopened that landmark Selfridges uh, building there, covered in metal discs, hundreds of new shops, thousands of new jobs created. Millions, tens of millions of pounds are being pumped into Birmingham by the authorities that are already in place. So there should be a feel-good factor here. A lot going on in the city, but people, there's an assumption that people will stand back from that and say, well, that's fine on one level, but they'll think about the global picture. They'll think about their take on the war, whether it was the right idea or not. And as I say, many parts of the country, people talk about an anti-war sentiment, but we do have a large Muslim population in this particular part of the country. That may or may not make a difference. Certainly in the, the run-up to the election here, some local Conservatives have been saying they're convinced that it will make a difference. But of course, Conservatives uh, in broad terms supported the war. So on paper, it uh, would be the Liberal Democrats who would stand to benefit. Last time around, when there were partial elections here a year ago, Labour did lose that uh, majority. And on that that occasion it was the Liberal Democrats who benefited. For the moment, thank you, Peter. And for the latest results in your area, visit BBC News Online's special website. That's at bbc.co.uk slash vote2004. Now, the view from the Liberal Democrat camp. Leader Charles Kennedy absolutely delighted this morning. He's been pouring scorn on attempts by some Conservatives to belittle his party's gains. Uh, I don't think there's anything dishonest about an authoritative BBC analysis based on real votes cast which show we're going to come second in these elections. That is historic in itself across the country and that from the Conservative point of view they can't elect a single councillor in Liverpool, in Manchester or in Oxford. Let's hear no more of this nonsense of recent months about a revival for the Conservatives. This is a, a thumpingly good result for the Liberal Democrats and I think there's more good news to come in the course of this morning. We've taken the fight to both the other parties and we've displayed in the north and in the south that we can take them on and we can beat them. You mentioned the uh, ironclad uh, BBC analysis. Of course, uh, BBC analysis also pointing out that where you have suffered uh, with the Tories breathing down your neck in the south is also often marginal seats for you uh, in the Westminster Parliament. Now, that must be worrying you. Mixed picture there. If you take, for example, a parliamentary constituency that we hold as one of a number in Hampshire, Eastleigh, 
but we also control the council. Not only have we maintained our position there, but we've taken seats off the Conservatives. We've been taking seats off the Conservatives in other parts across the south as well. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but Eastbourne, Worthing, Cheltenham, I mean, these are all very key areas for you. You just haven't done well overnight. Well, that's not the case, actually, because if you look at each and every one of those, we've lost about two or three uh, wards in each case they've gone from outright Liberal Democrat control to no overall control but still with ourselves as the largest single party. That stands in stark contrast to the Labour hemorrhaging of support in particular. When we start winning in places like Cardiff, in Manchester and Birmingham, gains uh, off Labour and Conservative in double figures, that is a really dramatic breakthrough and it is far outweighs any marginal losses at the edges that we've sustained. But those are not, I mean, those seats in big metropolitan areas, especially up in the north, I mean, they are not target seats for you in a general election, are they? You've got no hope of winning those in a general I take, election. I take issue with that completely. Uh, look at Stockport Council. We defended that last night. We increased our majority. We already have two parliamentary seats in that vicinity, which in themselves owe a lot to the work that's been done locally over the years. Sheffield, but again, and I think we're going to see good news for us later on in the course of today. We have a parliamentary seat in Sheffield, which is a reflection of the local progress that was made over the years. And I think we will certainly be seeing the same now with a view to the next election in wards and parliamentary constituencies in Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, Newcastle. Now, this is really going to change the entire context of British politics with a view to the next election. It's a three-party fight from here on in, and we're one of the three principal parties. Charles Kennedy there speaking to me earlier. Now, let's look at some of the key results for the Conservatives. Wins include Trafford, Tamworth and Brentwood. And the Conservative Party chairman, Dr Liam Fox, said that they'd enjoyed some spectacular results at Labour's expense. More on all of that uh, very shortly, uh, plus roundup of results which are coming in around the country, first here on News 24 with all our correspondents. Let's have a little look at the weather now. Here's Rob. Good morning. It's about to get hot again. Not so much today or even tomorrow. But on Sunday, as the humidity rises and so do the temperatures, I think you can call it hot. And certainly by the start of next week, it won't just be in England. Now, the whole of the UK should see a warming trend. Today, though, it's a little cooler than yesterday. Warm sunshine, admittedly, you can see the ground over most of the UK. But there are showers, been showers frequently in the Pennines all night. And they're getting rather more obvious now in Scotland than they will be in Northern Ireland. Thunder is going to be around, but a lower risk than yesterday. There shouldn't be such vicious showers. And for the rest of England and Wales, we could see a decent shower in the afternoon, but for most of us it will still be dry. Today's temperatures are down on yesterday by about a degree, and it's a little fresher and there's more of a breeze, so it won't feel quite as warm. And the evening should see most of these showers disappear, so it'll be a largely dry uh, a barbecue night, if you like. But there's just one downside for hay fever sufferers. The pollen index has been high for the last two weeks. It's now very high, and the evening, of course, is when the grass releases its second pollen of the day. artists in Europe. Euro 2004. Presented by the Past Masters. Starts tomorrow live and interactive on the BBC. The Euro election results come in on June 13th. Do you know the name of your MEP? Negative. <laughs> no idea. Oh gosh, I should know. No. Does the outcome affect you? It affects everyone really indirectly, doesn't it? The Euro election results. All your questions answered. This Sunday, live from 9 on BBC News 24. If it happens, it happens here. short of 11.30. Welcome if you're just joining us. Full coverage of all those local election results. We're expecting results to come in pretty shortly from uh, big metropolitan areas like Newcastle and Birmingham. Stay with us. And they'll get them first here. Labour has suffered heavy losses in the council elections in England and Wales. Both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats have made gains at Labour's expense and the Conservatives have won councils from the Lib Dems. 
As results have yet to come in, the Home Secretary, David Blunkett, says he's mortified by his party's performance and that Iraq has damaged the party. So far, it's lost control of seven councils, including the former strongholds of Swansea, St Helens and Bassetlaw in Nottinghamshire. They've lost more than 200 councillors. The Health Secretary, John Reid, told the BBC he wouldn't go as far as his Cabinet colleague, the Home Secretary, in using that word mortified by Labour's performance. I don't think last night's results are particularly good for anybody. I mean, obviously, they aren't good for us. But uh, any hopes of a Conservative big breakthrough have obviously now been laid to rest for a while. Um, and I suppose the smaller parties take some satisfaction out of it. No, I don't think they're, they're great results for anybody. Now, they don't particularly indicate much at all, I think, about a prospective general election. Dr Reid, the Conservatives say they've enjoyed some spectacular results at Labour's expense. They've more than 100 new councillors, taking control of six additional councils, including Trafford. The projected share of the vote nationally puts them first, with 38%. Although this is no better than the figure when William Hay was leader, the party say things are different today. I've met deep disillusionment with Labour, much, much wider and deeper than just dissatisfaction over Iraq. People feel deeply let down, they feel that the government has lied to them and manipulated information. They're fed up with that. And I think that is a significant difference from the last time we were on this very high vote share. There's a 12-point lead now, Conservatives over Labour. The last time we had a, a lead in 1992, we had an eight-point lead. I think nobody could argue now that we're not winning with a really good chance of winning that next general election. The Liberal Democrats say they're delighted with their results, which have seen them gain almost 70 extra councillors so far. But gains in some areas have been matched by losses elsewhere. The party has taken control of Pendle, but lost Cheltenham and Eastbourne to the Tories. The smaller parties, such as the Greens and the UK Independence Party, increased their share of the vote to 6%. The Liberal Democrat leader Charles Kennedy says the message from the poll to the government is that British politics is changing out of all recognition. When you think of how many of our parliamentary seats were built on the years of steady success at local authority level, this augurs very well indeed. And the next general election, I think, is going to be much more now a three-way national contest with us having challenged and seen off the Conservatives in many parts of the South and the West we're now taking the fight to Labour and beating them in their heartlands in the north. Charles Kennedy. A British National Party candidate in the local elections has been released on police bail after being arrested at last night's count in Sunderland. Ian Ledbitter was detained on suspicion of assault during protests outside the Crow Tree Leisure Centre. He came fourth in the Red Hill Ward last night, missing out on a seat by around 800 votes. Other news now. Leaders from around the world will gather in Washington later today for a funeral service for former President Ronald Reagan. It's the culmination of several days of national mourning for Mr. Reagan. The Prince of Wales and Lady Thatcher will be among the guests at the ceremony. Afterwards, his body will be flown to California for burial. And we'll have special coverage of the funeral of Ronald Reagan this afternoon from 3.30. That's here on BBC News 24 and on BBC One. And if you want uh, to keep up with the headlines, the weather and the sport, you can on our interactive service, BBC I. To do that, press the red button and then follow the on-screen instructions. Now, breaking news, Stratford-on-Avon, one of those uh, election results coming in, a Conservative hold in Stratford-on-Avon. Uh, you're seeing Craven there, but uh, what I was talking about, Stratford, Conservatives have held Stratford. We'll bring you more on that in a moment. Now, looking to some of the smaller parties, because this is, of course, not just a three-horse race, and the Greens have made some gains when leaders there are expressing their pleasure at some of the results so far. Let's take a look at uh, their results. Uh, they've kept seats in Manchester, picked up seats in Oxford, Norwich and Watford. And um, Oxford particularly, I think they got an extra four in there. Um, now, I think we're going to talk now to Newcastle we're going to go to because uh, we'll come back to the Greens in a moment talk about what they've done. But we're going over to Newcastle, very important result coming in. The following candidates of the new election for the Paul Young, Peter John and David Hayden Bezerg. Thank you. Um, I didn't 
catch, hard to catch that result. I hope our correspondent's standing by. Mark, can you hear, did you gather what just happened yes, there? Yes, I can. Yes. That's uh, the fourth declaration that we've had today uh, in the Newcastle account. And so far, if the Prime Minister is watching what's happening in his uh, northeastern backyard, he must be biting his nails because we've had those results and they make very, very grim reading for Labour. Particularly one result which has always been seen as a swing ward, really, the Oosburn ward, ward in uh, Newcastle, which has gone in its entirety to the Liberal Democrats. About half an hour ago we were getting the picture that uh, things are on the slide for Labour. Well, it has continued because Liberal Democrats are winning three wards so far. That's nine seats on the new council. Just to give you an idea, they need to hit 40, 40 seats on the council to have an overall majority. So they're edging uh, steadily towards that target as we go through this morning. Uh, there are many, many more seats to count here, but the mood here is, is very, very much uh, that uh, there are nervous Labour Party people here. Bear in mind also that uh, the Conservatives are watching this as a result closely as well. They haven't had a councillor on Newcastle since, uh, well, uh, eight years. Eight years back you have to go to find a Tory councillor in Newcastle. They reckon they have hopes in about four separate wards in this city. We expect to get uh, a lot of results through in the next 45 minutes to an hour, so we'll be watching those closely. That, Mark, thank you so much. We'll come back to you as and when you get those. Thanks for explaining that. And uh, we've got uh, Tony Travers from the London School of Economics uh, heroically sitting on set here throughout all of this. Uh, Tony, you were talking about Newcastle earlier. Yeah. Things <coughs> looking as if they're going the way that you were describing. Yes, I mean, there has been a great deal of debate in, in Newcastle about the possibility of the Liberal Democrats sweeping through into power. Too early, of course, yet to be sure. But it does look as if in this pretty heartland type heartland for the Labour Party that the Lib Dems have yet again as they have in Liverpool and Sheffield in the past being able to chip their way into an old-fashioned Labour bastion and it begins to look as if it might just happen here now. And I think we're joined also by Professor John Curtis, a sophologist, a election watcher. Professor Curtis, what's your assessment of the results we've just seen coming in this morning? Well, certainly those results from Newcastle are precisely what the Liberal Democrats were hoping for. Uh, but so, that's so far perhaps one of the first few straws in the wind we've had. So far we've seen a continuation of the Labour Party losing votes in the wars that have been declared so far. Both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats are making gains. So, so far the picture that we painted overnight seems for the most part to be holding firm. And um, we were talking earlier, I was talking earlier to Tony here on set about this this pattern whereby we're getting uh, conservative gains but not directly at the expense of Labour and Labour losses but not directly at the expense of the Conservatives. What do you see that as indicating? Well, I think it's indicating, first of all, that where Labour voters are disillusioned, they are disenchanted with incumbent government, uh, they are more likely to use the Liberal Democrats as their vehicle of protest than they are the Conservative Party, and, and that, I think, is much in line with the experience of British politics over the last 30 or 40 years. In contrast, of course, because the Conservatives are now looking at least that little bit stronger, some of those people who perhaps defected to the Liberal Democrats in the past from the Conservative Party in some of the more traditional blue-chip areas of the country are perhaps now beginning beginning to return to the Conservative Party and that's why we're seeing the Liberal Democrats on occasion struggling to hold on to some of those wards where they're being challenged by the Conservatives. Tony Travers, we, we were watching a moment ago the results for the Greens. I mean, they've obviously yeah. done a little bit better in the, than in the past. But do you see a certain degree of fragmentation, things going more in the directions of the smaller parties? Again, it's, we have to be, I mean, we'll get a real clue uh, when we get the Euro elections on Sunday, but that, there has been a little fragmentation, though frankly, remember, we've been talking a great deal about a Conservative Labour Lib Dem uh, set of movements this morning. I mean, the, 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 if you look at the Green successes, they won three seats in Norwich, four in Oxford, one in Watford. Um, I mean, these are impressive on a small scale, but they're not the Greens sweeping through, or, or indeed the BNP or any of these parties sweeping through. So the three-party, what used to be a two-party system, now a three-party system, has held up reasonably well so far. No evidence of a massive uh, push through by smaller parties, but there's chipping away going on here. And your point, a three-party system, I mean, obviously Charles Kennedy saying that very firmly today, this is now clearly a three-way race. I mean, my impression is the Lib Dems say that every election. Yes, but it was really interesting about what we've heard from uh, Charles Kennedy and from Liam Fox, the Conservative chairman, is in a sense they've been uh, trying to 
suggest it's they who've really done well out of this election. And you can see they're competing for the spoils of the, 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 the falling Labour vote. Uh, and it really is now a three-way split. Conservatives ahead in terms of the vote, Lib Dem second, Labour third. But a lot of fights now between Labour, sorry, between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives as to who's really won here. Yes, um, Professor Curtis, back to you in our election studio. I mean, that chipping away at each other, raining on each other's parade between the Lib Dems and the Conservatives, that's quite a notable thing that we're seeing throughout this morning, isn't it? It is quite a notable thing, and, of course, it's the thing that makes these results seem nothing like as bad for the Labour Party as they otherwise would. Uh, the so Labour Party's potential salvation out of these results is that while they themselves may now be a pretty much as unpopular as any previous British government in mid-term, it looks as though those protest votes are scattered across the two principal opposition parties. And as a result, we can still look forward to the possibility uh, that Labour might win a general election in 12 months' time because those anti-Labour votes are going to get split. In a sense, ironically, we're almost now seeing the reverse of the position that the Conservatives were in the 1980s when, again, it was argued that the Conservatives were able to win elections thanks to a split of the vote then between Labour and the SDP Liberal Alliance. And so, Professor Curtis, when we, we see David Blunkett saying mortification but no meltdown that's a fair enough assessment there is no meltdown well, I think it's fair to say that isn't, there isn't a meltdown so far as the gap between Labour and the Conservatives are concerned. If one bears in mind the Labour Party always does less well in local elections than in general elections, then probably this is an indication that amongst the electorate as a whole, the Labour Party is not that far behind the Conservatives. But on the other hand, we should be, uh, bear in mind that as its share of the vote, Labour has done worse in these local elections than in any previous set of local elections. And to that degree, at least, the Labour Party has suffered a severe blow. Uh, comparing local elections with local elections, this is clearly Labour's worst result and it must be something that concerns the party. Professor Curtis in our election studio and uh, Tony Travers here with me on the set. Thank you both very much for now. We'll be back for more later. More on Labour now. Let's look at some of the key results in so far for them. The party has lost control of the former mining area of Bassett Law for the first time since 1979, as well as suffering defeats in areas such as Burnley, Swansea and Oxford. But the party did win Stoke-on-Trent, and despite losing some seats, Labour held Manchester. Uh, now, let's uh, see what that uh, extraordinary electoral genius upsummer has got to say for himself, Peter Snow. A special survey all over the country to see what people think of the political parties, and in particular, we started off with asking what they think of Labour after seven years in power. Has Labour delivered a strong economy as they promised, we asked? Well, 50% said yes to that last year, and now it's 58% saying yes to that. So 8% more people this year, in spite of the Iraq war and all Mr Blair's tribulations, 8% more this year say Labour's delivering a strong economy. Let's now have a look at some of the other policies on which Labour said they would deliver certain things. First of all, the economy, we've seen there an 8% increase for Labour over the last year. On crime, there's a 7% increase. And there's a 4% increase in education. 4% more saying that Labour has delivered education, education, education. Remember that slogan. And on saving the NHS, 3% more think Labour's delivered on that. These are all on the right here, fairly small basis. Only about a third or just over a third of the population think Labour has delivered. But the point is, it's going up, the proportion of the population who think Labour has delivered on that. A few more questions we asked people about all the political parties. Which party do you think has a good team of leaders, we said? Well, Labour, 40%. The Conservatives, 21%. In spite of Michael Howe's new leadership, several months as leader now, not much difference there, a long way behind the Labour Party. And the Liberal Democrats on 22%. We also asked people, who, which party do you think is trusted to run the NHS? And again, it's Labour there, well ahead of the other two parties. And then we went back to the economy. We said, OK, which of the three parties do you think is most trusted to run the economy? One of the most important election issues, especially the most important election issue of all. And on this one, you can see nearly half of the population, 47% saying Labour, 32% saying the Conservatives, and 17% the Liberal Democrats. Now, we then went on. That all looks quite promising for Labour and Mr Blair. We then went on to ask about the crucial headline of the past year, the war in Iraq. And we asked this question. We said to people, all right, let's talk about the Iraq war. 
thinking about the build-up to the Iraq war and everything that's happened since, do you think that taking military action was the right or the wrong thing to do? And here were the answers people gave a year ago and today. Right. Well, now, last year, 58% said it was the right thing to do. Today, 38%. Now, 55% think the war is wrong, whereas last year, 34% thought it was wrong. So there has been a very, very seismic shift in people approving the war in Iraq. And that has greatly damaged Mr. Blair's personal representation, uh, reputation, as we'll see a bit later on. Peter Snow there. Now, what's the situation in Wales? Our correspondent, Sean Lloyd, is in Cardiff. Give us the overview on the principality, Sean. Well, one of the uh, perhaps uh, most interesting things happening at the moment is actually here in Cardiff because there's a bit of a cliffhanger going on. There's 19 seats still actually be, to be declared. Uh, four are going to be recounted at this leisure centre in Llanishan here behind me later on this afternoon and some are being recounted in City Hall. But it looks at the moment that Labour are within just one seat of actually losing their overall majority here in Cardiff. That would be uh, an immensely bitter blow for them. The Liberal Democrats are making gains in Cardiff all over the place at the moment. Now, much of the campaigning here has centred around the personality of the controversial leader of the council, Russell Goodway, who's just about to manage to hang on to his seat, but he may not be leader of the council for, for too much uh, longer. There's also been a blow for the Labour Party in Swansea. Uh, no over con overall control there now for Labour. They've lost it after 25 years. The Liberal Democrats and Plaid Cymru making gains there. Now, whereas uh, the war in Iraq is one of the issues that's been blamed of perhaps for Labour supporters staying at home in Swansea. In Cardiff, Russell Goodway has made a very outspoken uh, comment blaming the Welsh Assembly Government for uh, the loss of Labour support, saying that uh, Rodri Morgan, the First Minister, should have gone to France to commemorate D-Day, that many Labour supporters were disgusted that he did not, and also blaming the Welsh Assembly's record on the NHS here in Wales. Um, if I can tell you about the Conservatives, their ambitions uh, were to get overall control in the Vale of Glamorgan. There has been a recount this morning. That's just finished and they haven't been able to take overall control there. They're also targeting Monmouthshire. We haven't had the result in of that yet, but we are told that Plaid Cymru has taken its first seat ever in Monmouthshire. So again for them there. And also Plaid Cymru have made some gains in Ceredigion, but not enough for them to take overall control of that borough. Of course, uh, interesting interesting things for Plaid Cymru is uh, Ron the Con on Tav, which we were a little bit earlier this morning. It looks like they're actually going to lose control of Ron the Con on Tav, that that will go back to Labour. So the Green Valley is turning red there. there. Plaid Cymru also hoping to uh, hold on to Caerphilly, but Leanne Woods, the AM, telling me this morning that she doesn't think that they will. Thanks for that roundup, Sean. Now let's look at the headlines. Labour has recorded its worst local election result in living memory. David Blunkett admits he's mortified by the outcome. The Conservatives have made significant gains. The party chairman welcomes their improved results in urban areas. The Liberal Democrats have at least matched their best performance, although they were pushed hard by the Tories in some areas. Now, we mentioned a moment ago that Stratford-on-Avon being held by the Tories. Let's just look at the full result there. This was never a fight for Labour. This was always between the Tories and the Lib Dems. And as you can see, uh, Tories up three there. It's not a, it wasn't a whole council re-election there. It was just a third of the seats. But anyway, they're up three. Lib Dems down two. And Labour have lost their one councillor. They're down to zero. Now, let's talk hamstrings. <laughs> Here's Mike yes. Bushell. Mike Hopefully Gordon. amended one. <laughs> Midterm blues for Labour. After the party takes heavy losses at the local elections, the Home Secretary admits he's mortified by the performance. Conservatives celebrate significant successes, although so far no better than four years ago. Liberal Democrats also make gains, profiting most from Labour's problems in its heartlands. And other news, America prepares to honour former President Ronald Reagan at his state funeral in Washington. And a court hears the man accused of killing Caroline Dickinson carried a picture of the teenager in his wallet.
Coming up in this hour, we'll be live at the Count in Newcastle, where the Liberal Democrats are hoping to take control of the City Council there. And we'll also cross to Birmingham, where Labour is also under pressure. Now we're going to go straight over to Newcastle, in fact, because we're just hearing, not officially, but we're just hearing that uh, Labour have lost overall control. Mark? Yeah, they want the full result, Mark. The full result? Well, you know, the result of the well apologies for that. We just didn't seem to have uh, contact with Mark. Let's just see if we can, if we can make contact with him again, because it is a very important result for Labour and the Lib Dems. Uh, Mark, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, we have some very significant news just coming through in the last uh, five minutes, which is that the leader of Newcastle City Council, the leader for many years, Tony Flynn, and his deputy, Keith Taylor, have both lost their seats. Uh, the ward they're in has fallen to the Liberal Democrats today. And this is part of a wider picture that is coming through of the Liberal Democrats winning seats across this city. And the Liberal Democrats at the moment are halfway to their winning post, if you like, of winning uh, 40 seats on this council. This all in the context of a council that's been held by Labour since 1974. Uh, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Peter Arnold, on the city council has said that although the Iraq war has tipped the balance at this council, there are other factors. He says the party has worked hard in this not traditionally Lib Dem territory, and that's part of the factors. And we've also learned in the last few minutes that Charles Kennedy, the Lib Dem leader, is on his way to the North East today, which gives you a good indication of the mood of the Liberal Democrats today. So far, no seats for the Conservatives here. Their hopes were high this morning that they'd get something. But so far, with about half the wards to declare, nothing from them as yet. But the big message here, the leader of Newcastle Council losing his seat. Thank you very much. Come back to you for more from Newcastle later. Now, you just uh, saw a moment ago on the screen there, just as Mark was talking, the result from Glam Vale of Glamorgan, that uh, no change, no control there. Uh, Labour down 250. Oh, this is overall, we're looking at the results now. Uh, Councillors uh, down 215 for Labour. Uh, Conservatives up 100. And Lib Dems up 62. So, as we've been saying, both the Liberal Democrats and the Tories claiming uh, big successes, although both of them taking pot shots at each other's results. The results overall for the councils, let's take a look at that uh, now. And as you can see, Labour down seven there, Le left currently. Of course, we've still got a lot of results to come in. But the picture right now, uh, Labour down seven on 14 councils. And the Conservative picked up six new councils, up to 31. And the Lib Dems, despite having taken a lot more councillors and despite being second in the overall vote, they've actually lost to control of, of two councils. And there you can see a little hodgepodge of different things, um, residents' associations and no control uh, down at the bottom. Now, over to Phil for more on the projections. Phil. Yes, the latest BBC projection, which is based on more than 600,000 votes cast in 300 key wards, suggests that the Conservatives would have 38% of the vote. Charles Kennedy's Liberal Democrats would gain 30% of the vote. Labour, 26%. The first time that a party in power at Westminster has come third in the local elections. The smaller parties, such as the Greens and the UK Independence Party, are predicted to get a total of 6% of the vote. The turnout, around 40%. Our chief political correspondent, Gitto Harry, is at Westminster. Gitto? Yes, yeah, so Phil, first of all, on Newcastle, I've just been looking again at a text message I got last night, just when I finished work about 11.30, sadly, after I'd last been on air, saying, off the record, Newcastle is going our way. It's definitely one to watch. There you have it. That man has been proved right. I've just seen another Lib Dem here going yes at the news that Labour has lost Newcastle. There's something there to celebrate for the Lib Dems. There's something, of course, for the Tories to celebrate. It's been a very bad night for Labour. Everybody's trying to put their spin on all of this. And, of course, we've got days of results to go. Polly Billington now reports on the situation as it is. Trafford is Tory once more. Once it was a shining example of Conservative rule in a northern city, but it fell to Labour during the 90s. Getting it back suggests the Tories can make headway in urban areas in the north. It could be that Labour falls into third place across the country, which heartens the Tories. 
There's a 12 point lead now, Conservatives over Labour. The last time we had a, a lead in 1992, we had an eight point lead. I think nobody could argue now that we're not winning with a really good chance of winning that next general election. Claiming back natural territory like Brentwood in Essex cheered Conservatives too. But it could be the party's share of the vote is no greater than under William Hague in 2000, and we all know what happened to him. But Labour lost out in heartland areas like Burnley and St Helens. Ministers recognise it's not been a good set of results for Labour. I'm mortified that uh, we're not doing better than we have done. We know it's been a bad night, but we're obviously going to have to present the facts as they are. So, yeah, a very uh, a bad night for us, but not meltdown. No takeoff for the Conservatives. They haven't even got the undercarriage down, never mind uh, managed to actually get across the, uh, across the Atlantic or, or, dare I say, at the English Channel. But Iraq has clearly been a factor, and certainly one the Liberal Democrats have made the most of as they won seats from Labour. In the South, though, the Liberal Democrats lost out to the Conservatives. This doesn't bode well for their chances of increasing the number of MPs, but they're still upbeat. The next general election, I think, is going to be much more now a three-way national contest with us having challenged and seen off the Conservatives in many parts of the South and the West. We're now taking the fight to Labour and beating them in their heartlands in the North. What MPs want to know from these results is what will happen to them. Will they get re-elected to come back to Westminster if there's a general election next year? Who will end up running the country? Now, these local election results do not look good for Labour, but there's still a long way to go for the Conservatives before Michael Howard should book those removal men to put him into number 10. Polly Billington, BBC News, Westminster. Yes, as Polly was saying, most MPs are just looking at these results, trying to see what it tells them about their own selfish prospects of getting back here in about a year's time when we expect a general election. But there are other parties fighting for different things. They're not dreaming of being in Downing Street, at least not yet, but they are. Uh, they do have their agendas, they do have things that they want to achieve, and they had a very interesting night, and it makes British politics that bit more interesting, as Tim Wilcox now reports. While the big parties battle it out over the first three places, some of the smaller ones are today quietly enjoying their own electoral successes. The Greens, seen here celebrating in Oxford, are already eight seats up nationally on their last result. And the UK Independence Party, which is predicted to do well when the Euro votes are counted on Sunday, has also made two gains, its candidate in Hull taking his seat from an independent. But perceived as a single-issue party, wasn't this just a protest vote? It's not just a protest vote. People are absolutely fed up with Europe. We know we've got policies on everything, not just Europe, and this is why they're giving us our, their support. In Wales, Plaid Cymru's been hoovering up more seats. They're up 11 so far, including inroads into Ceredigion. We've also made some interesting gains in places like Newport, Cardiff and Swansea, which we're overjoyed about. They might be small gains, but they are... They do show the start of a breakthrough in the cities for Plaid Cymru, which is something that's vitally important for us. But there's been a reversal of fortune for the BNP in Burnley. Its share of the vote there has dropped by 10%, and it made no breakthrough in Pendle. Voters' anger with the government hasn't filtered down to all the smaller parties. Tim Wilcox, BBC News. When you next come back to us, I'll be introducing you to the senior Liberal Democrat, Ed Davey, a very happy man, having heard what's happening in Newcastle. But for now, back to you in the studio to find out more about that and other things. Thanks very much, Gitto. Now, let's have a look at some results that uh, have been coming in earlier. Let's take a, a closer look at them. Mole Valley, no overall control. Started that way, stayed that way. And it's the same story in the Vale of Glamorgan. There you can see the results coming up. The Conservatives on 20, Labour 16, Plaid Cymru 8. Now, it's not just a three-horse race. As Gitto was saying, some people got no hope of ever getting into Downing Street or not in the very near future. Some of the smaller parties, let's take a look at them now. UK Independence Party, it took two council seats overnight. Its leader, Roger Knapman, welcomed his party showing in the local election, saying they were now mounting a credible challenge to the main parties. Well, all I know is that every time we stand, our share of the vote increases, and that improves our credibility. Now, we were told we were taking all our votes from the Conservatives, but it seems as though the seats so far 
are in Hull, Derby and Hartlepool. So it's beginning to look as though we can attract votes from right across the board, from the Labour, from the Liberal, from the uh, Conservatives and from Britain's biggest party, the stay-at-home party. The party in Oxford say they've won seats by fighting for real issues. Local issues. We didn't put out leaflets saying vote green because we're anti-war. We, we put out leaflets on the issues uh, tackling and um, the, the local council on their poor record. And we won one seat from the Liberal Democrats, I mean, and three from Labour. So, so it wasn't all that we, we won from Labour. I think that's very much on local issues. Well, that's the view from a couple of the smaller parties, but uh, let's look at the big beasts in the jungle again and at the results for Labour. Uh, party has, of course, lost control of the former mining area of Bassett Law for the first time since 1979, as well as suffering defeats in areas such as Burnley, Swansea and Oxford. But the party did win Stoke-on-Trent, and despite losing some seats, Labour held Manchester. Now, we're going to get some reaction uh, in a moment from Newcastle, where, of course, very dramatic events happening in the last few minutes. We were just hearing from our correspondent there that uh, the Labour leader of the council has lost his seat. But we're going to go first to um, Birmingham, which, of course, is again a bit of a nail-biting finish. Uh, Peter Lane there. Peter, what's happening? We are expecting in about five minutes' time to get the first declaration uh, from the room behind me here, very large room in the city centre, the Birmingham National Indoor Arena. They started counting at nine o'clock this morning and, like I say, hopefully in five minutes' time we'll have the first result. There are uh, more seats than ever up for grabs. There's a whole new ward has been created here with lots of boundary uh, changes this year, so 120 seats up for grabs. Historically, over the past 20 years or so, Labour's been the biggest party on the council, although they did lose a considerable number of seats last time around to the Liberal Democrats. So the Liberal Democrats certainly hoping to improve. The Conservatives are putting, uh, pinning a lot of their hopes on local issues. They're talking about uh, a £200 million underground system that they would build uh, for Birmingham. So that's one of the issues that people have been talking about in the city in the run-up to this local election. But there's also an assumption here that with a large Muslim population in this part of the country, in fact, people will vote on uh, national issues and global issues, i.e. that the anti-war sentiment might cost Labour dear. But as the morning goes on, we're getting actually specific specific allegations being made about potential irregularities here. Uh, the leader of Birmingham's Liberal Democrats, John Hemming, is saying that 400 postal votes were stolen in his ward and that he's uh, been speaking to the police about that, although West Midlands Police haven't been able to give me any particular comment on that. He's also alleging that a large number, possibly up to a thousand postal vote forms, have, as he puts it, suddenly appeared here this morning and were dropped off in a car. He's claiming that the police were involved in that, that perhaps his car had been originally stolen. That's certainly something, again, we're trying to get more information from, from West Midlands uh, Police. But he's saying that in one of the ward counts here, there's total chaos. And uh, we are, of course, trying to get more detail on exactly what he means. Peter, of course, Birmingham, as you were saying, one of those incredibly uh, tight battles, quite hostile battles between, you know, three-way split and, and, and both the Lib Dems and the Tories really hoping to make progress in Birmingham. We were hearing from Newcastle, and we're going to go back there in a moment, about just how tense it is there, uh, the, the, the Labour looking very gloomy. Just what is the mood down there on the floor behind you? It's basically the mood of anything goes. Nobody has come in here completely confident because up until now, as I pointed out, Labour have, have been the biggest party, but they lost a certain number of seats last year. Historically, in the late 60s through the 70s and into the early 80s, Birmingham City Council flipped back and forth between Labour and Conservative control. The Conservatives have been quite bullish, although they supported the war and may uh, encounter some of the same anti-war backlash, perhaps, against them in the voting process. Maybe the Liberal Democrats, on paper, in theory, benefit from that. But the Conservatives coming into this saying that Labour have been damaged fatally damaged and that uh, Birmingham will be a key ground for that. It is, of course, England's second city. It's uh, one of the biggest local authorities in the country. It's got an annual budget of £2 billion. Uh, so there's certainly a lot to play for here. Peter, um, stay there. Obviously, we're expecting those results very shortly. Meanwhile, over to Newcastle, another cliffhanger, but extraordinary events going on there. Mark Denton, tell us more. 
Well, what's been happening in the last hours, we've learnt that uh, Tony Flynn, very experienced leader of this council, has lost his seat and it gets worse for Labour. His deputy, Keith Taylor, has also lost his seat. And bear in mind the context. This is a council that has been controlled by Labour for 30 years. We went into the start of this day, they had a thumping majority of 30, but the Liberal Democrats appear to be getting near to a winning post. Well, joining me at the count today is one of the local MPs, also, of course, former Minister for Agriculture, Nick Brown. Mr. Brown, this is disastrous for Labour, isn't it? It's certainly a very sad day for the Labour Party. We've uh, lost some very experienced and very hard-working public representatives. And I feel very, very sad about that indeed. I mean, sad for them personally, but also sad for the city of Newcastle. Newcastle is a well-run local authority. Well, you say it's sad, but what the message you're getting back, certainly from the Liberal Democrats, is that it's something that you had coming to you because you weren't listening as a party to the voters of Newcastle, particularly over an issue which local councillors can't do much about, but politicians nationally can, which is the Iraq war. Yes, the, the Liberal Democrats said, if you don't approve of the Iraq war, uh, vote for us and campaigned on that uh, issue and got votes because of it. But it's not got very much to do with running a local authority. There, there's one issue, one other issue, that is unique to Newcastle, and that is the collapse of the Conservative vote. The Conservative voters have clearly voted tactically against the Labour Party for the Liberal Democrats and thus boosted their vote and helped them achieve the results that they have uh, today. You look at Newcastle, it is a city full of Labour MPs, your seat included. Are you feeling a little bit jittery about your own fortunes at the general election, which, let's face it, could come in a year's time? I I'm comfortable with my own politics and they don't alter or, uh, or change uh, as a result of any question of expediency. I know what I stand for and I've stood before the electorate uh, before uh, securing my beliefs and I will do so again. And that will be true for the uh, other Labour MPs for this city. Remember, the, this isn't a great triumph for Liberal democracy. They fought the uh, election on an issue that isn't really very much to do with local government. Uh, and they took the votes of uh, the tactical votes of Conservatives who wanted to vote against Labour. I think there's also an issue about sending a, a message to the government mid-term. But of course, that isn't all there is to it here in Newcastle. Perhaps not, but isn't it also a message about the leader of your party, a man you know very well, the Prime Minister, who's a local constituency MP here. Aren't people saying in his own backyard, we want to be rid of Mr Blair? Uh, they're not saying that, and this isn't his backyard. And I think it's far too early to extrapolate from uh, local election results any anything about national personalities. Nick Brown, thanks very much. Nick Brown, of course, an MP here in the city of Newcastle. We'll bring you the latest results as they come through as we get close to that winning post for any parties of 40 seats. Mark, thank you very much. It was fascinating listening to Nick Brown there. And Peter, thanks very much also to you in Birmingham. Of course, straight back to you as soon as we get that result from Birmingham. And of course, just as we were seeing a moment ago there, you can see on the screen now Gateshead, uh, not far from where Nick and Mark were just talking, a Labour hold, as expected, a Labour hold in Gateshead. Now look at the headlines. Labour has recorded its worst local election result in living memory. David Blunkett admits he's mortified by the outcome. The Conservatives have made significant gains. The party chairman welcomes their improved results in urban areas. The Liberal Democrats have at least matched their best performance, although they were pushed hard by the Tories in some areas. And in sport, John Terry trains with England. He takes part in the warm-up as he bids to be fit for their opening Euro 2004 game against France on Sunday. Scott Styrus is finally out for 108 as Ashley Giles claims the wicket to leave New Zealand. 366 for seven now in the final test at Trent Bridge. And ahead of this weekend's Canadian Grand Prix, Ralph Schumacher says his brother Michael's success has made the sport rather boring. More on that and the rest of the sport at 12.45. See you then. Thanks, Mike. Let's look a, take a look at the breakdown in Gateshead there that we were just mentioning. Uh, Gateshead, obviously, a Labour hold uh, next door to Newcastle, where we've been hearing about all these problems, but in for Labour, that is. Um, but in Gateshead, Labour 43, down three, and the Lib Dems up three, took three, but not enough to make the difference, uh, of course, beginning to make a difference or appearing to make a difference in Newcastle. More on all that shortly. Now, our chief political correspondent, Gitto Harries at Westminster. Gitto? The Lib Dems have taken Newcastle. It won't be by accident. This is something they've been planning for guess how long? A whole year. Who is one of the main planners? Their spokesman on local government, their big tactician in these uh, areas, um, Ed Davey. Ed, um, do you know more about Newcastle than the rest of us? Is it going to be a Lib Dem victory? 
Well, what we're hearing, both from yourselves and from our contacts at the count, is that a Labour majority of 30, when Labour have held Newcastle for many years, is going to be turned over by the Liberal Democrats uh, today into a majority of maybe five, maybe even ten. That would be a staggering result, the biggest result of these elections by a long way. This is in Labour's, New Labour's heartland. There's Milburn and Byers and Blair himself come from the North East. And this success in Newcastle comes on the back of us taking Durham from Labour uh, last year. So we're beginning to be the main challengers in all these big Labour urban heartlands. And that really sets the Liberal Democrats up to be uh, a real challenge in the next general election. It's certainly interesting if it's true in uh, Newcastle. But this thing about beginning to take over from Labour has been something that I've heard all the time. I've been here at Westminster and this great big Lib Dem advance might actually happen, but it's going to take an awful long time. I'll be long gone by the time you guys end up in Downing Street if this is the pace of sort but of Gita, progress. It's happening now. At Liverpool, where we took control six years ago, we've now in even increased our majority there. Tremendous result. In Stockport, the same. Making big gains in Labour's heartlands like Swansea and Cardiff and Manchester and Rochdale and Bolton and Watford and Oxford. Now, this is a major uh, shift in British politics where in the big urban areas it's the Liberal Democrats who are the challengers and it'll be interesting to see what happens in Birmingham we're certainly predicting some gains against Labour there and possibly also in Sheffield and Leeds so this is it was a really good night for us and it's turning out to be an even better Friday you uh, say you make gains you take wards here and there but if you're a Conservative today, you could sit back and sort of look at all these councils that are now going to be run by your party. You have very few of those scalps, if you like, very few of those prizes that mean something between now and the next election, because for the Tories, they're now going to be running more parts of Britain than they were before. Very few of those we, cases We will for be you. running the big councils, the councils that really matter, like Newcastle. I mean, that's a huge big city. Liverpool, a huge big city. We may well turn out to be uh, in control with, with another party in Birmingham. We may even be pushing for power in places like uh, Sheffield, to share in, in, in power in places like Leeds. This is real power. And actually, it comes on the back of success in other elections. We, we held on to Milton Keynes, we, we've heard. We're doing well in in Watford and York. So this is a major, major push for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, Davy, thank you very much for joining us here. Uh, I'm sure you enjoyed that because the timing was perfect, of course, to have our Lib Dem contribution just when Newcastle looks to have fallen to them. Uh, back to you for more details uh, in the studio. Thanks, Gitto. Well, in a moment, we'll be speaking to our correspondent, Judith Moritz, who's in Manchester. First, let's take a look at some of those results in the north so far that Gitto was just talking about. Uh, Manchester, Labour hold on to Manchester. And in Trafford, the Conservatives have gained Trafford. We'll be talking to Judith Moritz there in a moment. Labour lose Burnley. And uh, as we've been hearing, however, though, they uh, held control of Gateshead. And uh, they held also Sunderland. So holding firm in some places, but of course significantly uh, losing or losing some significant wards in Newcastle. We haven't seen the whole picture there. And in Carlisle, no overall control there. Labour on 24, the Tories on 20. Now let's bring in Judith Moritz in Trafford, where the Tories took control after winning an additional 12 seats. So uh, tell us a bit more about the results there in Trafford. Well, those 12 seats you've just talked about, a gain of 12, 11 of them were taken off Labour. So the, the Tories here absolutely cock a hoop about the result. So happy, in fact, so excited and so keen to publicise it that uh, Mr Howard is on the way. Michael Howard, the leader of the Conservative Party, will be here in around an hour's time. He'll have his photograph taken upon the steps of the town hall behind me with some of the victorious Conservative councillors here. This is very much a Conservative seat which they really want to publicise. It's Formerly uh, here in the northwest, one of the Conservative jewels in the crown in local government. Uh, for 10 years it was out of Tory control and last night they won it back and they're making a lot of noise about it. So uh, Mr Howard on the way here to, to shake people's hand and congratulate them actually on the ground in Trafford. Tell us a bit about the area. I mean, it's as close really as the Tories get to controlling uh, an urban area, isn't it? Yes, it is. Let me give you the geography first of all. Uh, this is Trafford Town Hall. We're sandwiched 
pretty much halfway between Old Trafford Cricket Ground and Old Trafford Football Ground. Uh, and it is just the kind of typical place, uh, suburban area just outside of a major metropolitan centre, uh, which Labour won with a big swing in 1997. As we've said, it's been out of Conservative control uh, for 10 years and it's the kind of place that would be relatively more easy for them to start winning back. People here expected this result last night. Uh, the other thing to mention about this sort of area as well is that as well as national and international issues are playing a part there's also really a very large place here for local concerns grammar schools Trafford is one area which still has old-fashioned grammar schools not far from here uh, and that is something which local people guard jealously they want those to continue that really is a factor which can determine the vote here so why the big swing? Um, is it anti-Blair? Is it anti-war? But it can't be anti-war, really, can it, with the Tories supporting it? Uh, no, and, and as I've just said, I think those local issues here uh, almost play just as significant, if not a greater part, uh, than the war, than Iraq. You know, it comes down to local concerns. It comes down to uh, the schools here. It comes down to other facilities. Uh, it comes down to who cleans the streets and who takes your bins away and that sort of thing. And that is the sort of thing that people here are very concerned about. But also, uh, in terms of the climate here, as I've said, this is just the kind of area, just the sort of typical kind of suburban area uh, which Labour won in the general election in 97 uh, but really is if you dig a bit deeper more traditionally true blue it really was originally a conservative area it's taken the Tories some time to win it back but actually another interesting point here is that uh, we had all postal voting here in Trafford this year but not for the first time they actually did it for the first time last year so it's the second year of all postal voting uh, and the Tories have been chipping away at the result here uh, it went to no overall control a year ago and now it's gone fully conservative so the postal voting obviously something which has worked in the Conservatives favour as well Judith thanks very much indeed Trafford Town Hall Michael Howard on his way to celebrate. Well, more on the election results in a moment. First, the latest on the Caroline Dickinson murder trial in France. This morning, the court's been hearing how Francisco Montes bragged about sexually assaulting the teenager. Live now to our correspondent, John Kay, who's outside the court in Rennes. Uh, John, tell us what's been happening in court. Well, yes, this was uh, all from a character witness who was brought here to talk again about Francisco Montes. Uh, the man concerned is called Eduardo Suarez. Uh, he's Spanish, uh, like Montes himself, and uh, he was a, a good friend of Montes in Spain, living in the same town, running a, a car dealership business with him uh, for uh, several years in the late 90s, so after Caroline's death. Uh, he said during that time, Montes had shown him a photograph, a signed photograph of Caroline Dickens, and he said, oh, this girl was my girlfriend uh, we uh, we had a fantastic time together she was a model uh, he referred to her as a his china doll uh, as a little miss world and he said that he'd met her in a park and had made love with her all night uh, he said that she had now gone away he didn't uh, go into any more detail than that uh, and said that uh, it was that meant that uh, his friend wouldn't be able to wouldn't be able to flirt with her or or have any chance with her uh, obviously, this all very traumatic for the Dickinson family to hear, but uh, Sue Dickinson, Caroline's mother, actually questioned uh, whether this photo had really existed. Uh, she said as far as she knew, Caroline Dickinson had not taken a, a, a photo uh, on that school trip to Brittany with her, so it was impossible for Montes to have taken it from her bag in the hostel, as he'd claimed. Now, that questions uh, the witness we've heard, or maybe it questions what Montes told that witness, and that's the kind of debate that's going on in court at the moment. And, John, what else are we expecting in court today? Well, we're rapidly coming towards uh, the end of all the witnesses. Uh, we've got two more to hear from this afternoon after lunch, both of whom are experts. We believe they're psychologist experts who have, have monitored uh, Francisco Montes. Um, after that, the judge has decided that because it will be uh, quite late on Friday by that point, uh, that she will adjourn the case, she will let the jury go home for the weekend, and then they will return here first thing Monday morning for uh, the closing thoughts uh, from all the lawyers, from the judge herself, uh, and then they will go in to deliberate. Uh, now, we think that could be quite quick. The three judges sit with nine jurors and they come up with a verdict and then if a sentence is required, they come up with a sentence all at the same time. So it looks like probably by uh, tea time, your time on Monday, we could well have a verdict in this now notorious case. 
John, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us from Wren. Now, we just heard a few moments ago that Michael Howard is making his way to Trafford to celebrate the Tories' success there. We've got the first reaction from him this morning to the election results. Michael Howard says, we had an excellent result last night. We are now represented up and down the country in the cities where we want to play an important part. What I'm really concerned about is that we should put this country on the right track again. And Mr. Howard went on to say, I want a country where people are big and the state is small and in which we give everyone the kind of choice in health and education which today only people with money can buy. Michael Howard's comments a few minutes ago. Now, it's not just the local elections you have to worry about. London is choosing a mayor. The result is expected later on this afternoon. It looks like being a very tight finish, judging by that evening standard poll the other day. Or is it going to be a tight finish? Here's Chris Eakin. Chris. Well, Phil, yes, if only we knew the answer. I can tell you the very early indication is that we have reporters at a number of the counts, uh, and they're saying that it looks like Ken Livingstone may have a 6 to 8 percentage lead. Now, if that is the case, that is a greater lead than those last-minute polls you were mentioning, Phil, have suggested. Now, I'm actually at City Hall, where all the results will be collated once they've actually been finished. Counting has finished, they will come in here. And I should put a note of caution on that early figure I'm giving you, because we know that only 15 percent, 1 5 percent, of all of the votes cast have actually been scanned so far. This is an electronic count. The barcodes are scanned onto the computers, only 15 percent so far. Far. I'm at City Hall. It is Ken Livingstone's fiefdom, right by the Tower Bridge and by the River Thames. Quite provocative when it was built. It was a message to Tony Blair. I'm my own man. I am independent, because he was literally independent. He's now back with Labour, and that's the big question, of course. Just to what extent will Ken Livingstone be damaged in the way the party has been nationally? Now he's back in the party fold. Well, from the uh, group Mind the Gap, James Morris joins us here on the balcony of City Hall. Uh, I mean, is he under threat? Well, I think it's going to be a lot closer than people thought it was going to be. I mean, I still think we have the expectation that Ken's going to win tonight. Um, I think one of the interesting things, though, will be what will happen on the Assembly, because I think the Conservatives, are, um, all the polls are suggesting that the Conservative vote may well be up for the Assembly, which may mean that um, Labour lose a couple of seats which will have a significant impact on the way that Ken can actually then formulate his budget because, the, you know, the Assembly has the power to veto the budget and that could make Ken Livingstone's life a lot more difficult. Yes, because it is the watchdog over, over the mayor. And yeah. at the moment, there are nine Labour seats right. which lose one of those yeah. and then they lose the ability to stop a two-thirds majority yeah. vetoing the mayor's budget. And I think that um, if, the, if the UKIP uh, party do, as well as some of the polls are suggesting, they may well win a seat on the Assembly tonight. And again, that, that would have a big, big impact on the balance of power on the Assembly. And do you think it is likely that Ken Livingstone will be punished by Londoners for going back into the Labour Party fold? Punished in the way the party has been nationally, or will the personality buck the trend? All right, that's one of the big questions, the extent to which Labour's traditional supporters will come out and vote for Ken Livingstone. I mean, I think there has been some impact on the level of his support. I mean, we've definitely seen um, an erosion in Ken Livingstone's support over the last two or three weeks. How significant that's going to be, we're not sure. But um, I, I, I do think there's been some impact from his return to the Labour Party. Right, James. Thank you very much indeed. Let me just very quickly show you the, the media centre where the results come in. There is a, a, a news desk, as they've called it, just over to the left there. That's where all the results will come into this central city hall. We expect the mayoral result may be as late as tea time. Back to Phil and Carrie. Thanks very much, Chris. Sorry about the sound on that. wasn't perfect. We'll try and improve it in the meantime. Now, let's catch up with some weather. Here's Rob. Good afternoon. It's not quite as warm as yesterday. There's a bit more of a breeze and it's less humid. But the humidity will increase and the breeze probably die over the next few days to such an extent that it'll feel pretty warm on Sunday and probably hot on Monday. That doesn't just go for England and Wales. You could even use that term for Northern Ireland and a good part of Scotland. But this afternoon, uh, it looks similar the, to yesterday afternoon. A few sharp showers in southern England, quite a few sharp showers in Scotland and Northern Ireland. They're not quite as bad as yesterday, but many of them will die away by this evening to give a largely dry evening across the whole of the UK, with the ex exception maybe of Highland Scotland. Now, the pollen is still around, and the index puts it in the very high category for England and Wales. For hay fever sufferers, you'll already know, but it's also possible in Northern Ireland.
Tomorrow morning starts rather more cloudy but less wet in Scotland, grey mind you. Some sharp showers in England should disappear to give a largely dry afternoon with temperatures similar to today's. But Sunday, though starting grey, does promise some pretty good warmth, at least on the eastern side of England. Welcome to BBC News 24. Now more on our election coverage and no election is complete without Peter Snow. He's live in the BBC's election studio. Peter. Hello, and it's been a pretty bad night for Labour. We've been looking at the votes piling into the key wards over the past 15 hours or so, some one and a half million votes altogether, uh, and the picture is quite an interesting one. Some records created, in fact. What we do is we look at all these votes in the key wards, and then we can project. We assume everybody votes the same way all over the country, which, of course, they won't, but it is an indication as to how the country would vote. And then we can get this projected share of the vote. And here is the picture that we get when we project the results in those wards all over the country. The Tories on 38%. They did this well in the local election of 2000. Here they are now with 38%. 30% the Liberal Democrats, 8% behind in second place, pushing the Labour Party on 26% into third place with their worst ever local election share of the vote, and 6% the others. Now let's compare that with the general election of 2001, three years ago. Let's just look at what happens. Here we have then the Conservatives on the left there going up 5% on what for them was a terrible general election, the Liberal Democrats up 11% on their general election share, 16% down, a colossal collapse for Labour. 16% down on their general election victory in 2001. Now, even if you allow for the fact that the Liberal Democrats tend to do rather well in local elections, it's still a colossal swing, a very, very wide swing between the Conservatives and Labour. And that, if reflected in a general election, if it were reflected in a general election, would see the Tories, perhaps with the largest party, in a hung parliament. But can the government recover? Well, governments do recover, and history indeed suggests they recover sometimes quite dramatically. Let's look back a few general elections and see what, what has happened in the past. Go back, first of all, to Mrs Thatcher in 86, local elections 86. Between then and the general election a year later, she recovered. The Tories pushed their vote up by 9%. Same thing happened to John Major, 91 to 92. His vote pushed up 8% and 4% in 96 to 97, even though he lost the election. Now, Mr Blair, between 2,000 local elections, which William Hague won quite substantially, and the general election of 2001, pushed his Labour vote up 13%. OK, he now needs to push his local election share up in the year to come by 11% if he's to win the forthcoming general election. Now, clearly looking back at history, that is possible. It has been done before, only the last time. But it's going to be quite a mountain, clearly, for Mr Blair to climb. That was Peter Snow. Now, let's turn to the Greens. They had a good election. The latest indications are that they've picked up just over 10% overall. And let's look at the councillor's scoreboard there to put it all in some sort of perspective. Uh, Labour 863 down, over 200. The Conservatives on 728, up just over 100. The Lim Debs 586, and then the other parties. And the Greens have doubled their representations. Their spokesperson is Jean Lambert in our Westminster studio. So are you cracking open a bottle of organic bubbly? <laughs> Well, we, we have it in waiting for the, the full set of results. But, yes, I mean, they're good results for us. They're what we were expecting, and they look, look good for the Europeans on Sunday. But it's, it's a protest vote, isn't it? No, it's not a protest vote. The places where the Greens are actually picking up additional seats are places where we've already got, by and large, local councillors elected. So what it is that, is that once people see we're elected, see the work we can do, they're actually then prepared to put even more confidence in us and increase that, that, that result. So it, it's a very serious vote for people who actually want serious politicians doing the work. What are your voters going to get in return f for voting you in? I mean, you're not going to control any council or anything like that. How can you make your presence felt? Well, it may well be that we're actually in sort of coalition on certain councils. I mean, we have been in Oxford in the past. We'll see what happens there this time where we've regained the seats we lost last time. So 
in, in terms of what they get, well, obviously, they certainly get a greater priority in terms of, of traffic control, increased facilities for pedestrians, uh, a change in energy um, use often in the local councils. That's something that we did in Oxford last time. But it's a wish list, isn't it, if you're it's, not really in control? It's not I'm... a wish list. It's a list of things that the public actually want that you can then put on the agenda. And when other parties see that the public want it, then you begin to make things happen, as indeed we've done at the national level in the past where the environment is now a political issue, which it wasn't before the Greens got their good vote in 89. So what you're saying is you're a catalyst for change? We're a catalyst, but we're also in the position now of having those concrete policies that we want to implement, which makes us, I think, rather different to one or two other parties in this election who may have wish lists but not policies that they seriously are thinking of implementing. And when you push these green policies in local councils, mm. do you sense that you're pushing an open door? I think with, increasingly that is the case. I think people are seeing that a lot of the arguments that we're making are sensible arguments. They, don't, they, they actually increase their quality of life without necessarily increasing the budget. So, yes, I think they see that we're sensible, we're common sense, and that it's a vote well worth making for the Greens. Jean Lambert, with the bubbly on ice. You, know, <laughs> you expect, obviously, to do a bit better as things develop. Thanks very much for talking to us. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, let's have a look at Blackburn now. There is the Foreign Secretary, obviously, uh, Jack Straw, local MP. Um, no signs of the bubbly yet there. And uh, we haven't heard what the Foreign Secretary, or I haven't yet seen what the Foreign Secretary has had to say about the overall picture uh, overnight. We've heard from the Home Secretary talking about his mortification at how uh, Labour's performance is going and yet saying there is no meltdown. We've heard Dr John Reid uh, saying that uh, the results indicate nothing very much uh, we've heard Tony Blair overnight, actually before the results coming in, but Tony Blair saying that the opposition parties had articulated yeah. nothing that gave him yeah. po political concern. But he'll be relieved, I think, about the BNP. Uh, some people thought they might do rather well. In fact, uh, they haven't. I think they won one seat, but they lost another, so no change there as far as the BNP is concerned. Now, we were talking a moment ago about uh, what Michael Howard had had to say about the result. He's, of course, been travelling around the country celebrating his party's success. Oh, we had uh, excellent results uh, last night. Uh, we are now represented uh, up and down the country in the cities where we want to play an important part. Um, I've had a wonderfully enjoyable time at the school in Leicester this morning. And uh, I'm about to go off to, uh, to Trafford, where we had a notable victory last what, night. What are you hoping for, and, and what I'm really concerned about is that we should put this country on the right track again. I want a country in which people are big, but the state is small, and in which we give everyone the kind of choice in health and education which today only people with money can buy. Thank you, you done very enough much in these elections to make up for the Euro elections, Mr. Howard? Pretty, broad, uh, pretty broad smile there yeah. from Michael Howard. Now, we've got time to fit in some business news. Today's young people face poverty in old age, according to a report out today. Much more work to be done then. That's all the sport for now. Back at 1.15. Thanks a lot, Mike. Now, we can't ignore the small parties when we're talking about these uh, local election results, and some of them have, have had a good election. The Greens, for example, half of their eight new seats, however, came in Oxford, a city where the Conservatives have again failed to take a single ward. Our correspondent Bramwyn Jeffries is in the Dreaming Spires. Uh, Bramwyn, they're not necessarily representative of anywhere else, but what's going on in Oxford? Well, they've done extremely well here. They've more than doubled the number of seats they hold on the city council, going from three to seven. That's taken the council out of Labour control and into no overall control. They say that they campaigned principally on local issues, environmental issues, as you can imagine, some of them specific to a city like Oxford, which has, for example, congestion and traffic problems in the centre. But they also believe that they may have benefited from an anti-war vote as well. And um, so what about the issue of council tax, um, Bramwell? The, the, obviously there, you would have thought the Tories might be able to pick up on that. 
Well, they failed to make a single gain here in Oxford. Uh, the seats that went to the Greens went three from the Labour Party, one from the Liberal Democrats. This is the sort of place, as you say, when you'd have thought the Conservatives, given their nat national picture today, uh, would have hoped to do a little bit better. And they've, they failed, really, to, to make any mark here. Uh, Small parties have done well here in Oxford in the past. That's reflected in the green success. There are also three other uh, independent candidates. That's part of the mix here. And people we've been speaking to in the streets have been saying they like to see a mix of candidates on the lo local council. Uh, quite a lot of people were pleased uh, that it's now in no over control. They believe that means the parties will have to work together. And for local people, that may mean some benefits. Uh, Bramwin, just to break into that for a moment, I think uh, our viewers will be noticed on the screen that uh, key result from Newcastle there, that the Lib Dems have, as they had predicted, taken control of Newcastle, which is a colossally important result for them. But going back to Oxford, Bramwin, what next then? This is a bit of an exercise now in getting on with each other. Absolutely. And they're going to have to work out a, a way of getting on together. Of course, local, at local government level, councillors are very well able to do that. It happens all over the country. The Greens want to consolidate. Their seats are mainly in one part of Oxford, so they'll try and build on that. And they're now very much looking forward to Sunday. One of the Green Party's two MEPs come from the southeastern region. Uh, they hope that she will be re-elected on Sunday. They take today's results as a very hopeful sign for what they're showing might be at a European level. Bram, we're going to go over to Newcastle now because obviously that very critical result there. Uh, Mark, as you were saying earlier, it's fallen to the Lib Dems. It has. In the last 10 minutes, we've had the news through that that crucial 40-seat barrier has been crossed by the Liberal Democrats. We're getting declarations through the last couple. They have 44 seats. That means the Liberal Democrats have taken control of Newcastle Council for the first time in its history. 30 years it's been a Labour Council. Now it is a Liberal Democrat Council. And I think even on the speculation that was going on before then that perhaps the Liberal Democrats would hold the balance of power, be the largest party, uh, even with that optimism, there were no thoughts so that perhaps they could sweep past that barrier and take control here. We've been talking to Labour supporters here, very, very frustrated at what's going on. The Liberal Democrat campaign featured heavily some local issues, but also focusing on the, the war in Iraq, and they reckon that has actually tipped the balance here and taken this council into their control. So just a couple of uh, results to come, 44 seats for the Liberal Democrats. And, uh, Mark, we heard Charles Kennedy down at headquarters in Cowley Street saying that uh, he thought that they could build on this chip chipping away, this steady success at the local level to win parliamentary seats. But this is a very solidly Labour area at a Westminster level. It's absolutely a very solid Labour area. Uh, if you look at the Westminster map here, of what, where the MPs come from, they are all Labour MPs. This was almost beyond thinking that this could happen. Now, of course, you will get the, the, the arguments through from those Labour MPs, as we've been hearing already, that this is a local government election. People would not vote the same in a general election. Now, this will send shockwaves through a very traditional Labour-supporting part of the country. Remember, there are some very high-profile um, MPs in, in Newcastle. Nick Brown, the former Agriculture Secretary, represents a bit of Newcastle that includes Walls End. Doug Henderson, former Foreign Office Minister. And they will all be looking very carefully at what has gone on here and, indeed, what has gone wrong here for Labour. Mark Denton in Newcastle, thank you very much. Very significant result there in Newcastle. Lib Dems take that council after 30 years. Now, hundreds of England uh, football fans will be arriving in Portugal ahead of Sunday's Euro 2004 game against France. They're expected to spend most of the tournament in the city of Faro on the Algarve. Live now to our correspondent Jules Botfield, who is there. So, Jules, how many so far? Thousands already have arrived, but this is really probably just the tip of the iceberg, Phil. They're arriving at uh, Faro Airport. The Algarve, most people probably know, is quite a major tourist destination for the English anyway. So this is uh, an ideal base for England fans who are coming to watch matches here. The idea being that they'll come to the Algarve, they'll stay in traditional English tourist destinations between matches, and then they'll travel up. The first England game is in Lisbon on Sunday. Uh, we've had hundreds of fans come through already. Uh, we were at the airport yesterday as 
as well to watch a, a flight come in late last night from Manchester. And uh, the people who are just coming through arrivals behind me now are just off a, a slightly delayed flight from Stansted. Now, earlier on, Phil, we spoke to the director of the airport who said that they're very much used to these sorts of numbers. They've not even got any extra flights coming in from England. This is the usual numbers that they have uh, coming in from England on any summer, su uh, summer holiday at this time of year. So the only uh, additional thing to mention is that the Russian fans, those are the real numbers, more than 40 flights from Russia today and thousands of Russian fans pouring in for their first game against Spain tomorrow evening. Well, they're in for a warm welcome from the Portuguese, aren't they? Cheap beer and sardines. It's uh, wetting my appetite this lunchtime. <laughs> now, that's it from Phil and me. We vacate the chair and uh, John Sopel, Maxima Winnie here at one. Rob McElwee now, though, the weather. Showers shouldn't be quite as vicious as yesterday. They're pretty widespread in Highland Scotland. They'll be rather less widespread in the Aberdeenshire area and Fife and the central lowlands, but they might still be there. For example, at uh, Glen Eagles Golf Course, where yesterday there was lightning and the greens were flooded, it may well still shower, but I think it's a, a lesser risk. And for the next couple of days, it looks dry, if not necessarily overly sunny, although Sunday is pretty promising and it's warming up you'll notice and for Northern Ireland again although there might well be the odd flash of lightning it should be a day of showers rather than thunderstorms and some decent sunshine in still a fair breeze a breeze which is taking the showers across the Irish Sea and developing them over the Pennines as it has been doing for hours now I think much of Lancashire probably will stay dry as a result of the Pennines catching those showers now, south of that and east of that, there are very, very few showers, much like yesterday. It's not a bad day at all. Some nice sunshine. Yes, it's disappearing in the cloud now. And I think there'll be some sharp showers in southern England this afternoon, but few elsewhere. For example, Trent Bridge should stay dry. And here, too, you'll notice it's warming over the next couple of days. Not a bad evening. The day isn't quite as warm. The evening won't be quite as warm, but it's not a bad evening all the same, with the proviso that, of course, pollen levels are still high. In fact, very high over England and Wales, a position that probably won't change for the next two or three days at least. Now, I said today's temperatures were down on yesterday, not by much, by a degree or so for most of us, but there's more of a breeze and it's not quite as humid, so it does feel a different day. Now, humidity will increase over the next few days, as will the temperature, and quite dramatically so. It looks fairly likely that we'll be into the middle to high 20s in England and Wales and maybe the low 20s for Northern Ireland and Scotland by the end of the weekend, but not necessarily in blazing sunshine. For example, tomorrow starts quite cloudy and misty around northern Scotland with drizzle falling out of the sky. There will be some fairly sharp showers developing in the morning, most likely in central and southeastern England, which will likely die away in the afternoon. But at the same time, the cloud will probably sink south as well. So it may well be a fairly cloudy day with some mist around coasts, the coast therefore cooler, and nowhere really that much warmer than today, though it will probably feel a little different because the humidity is already rising by then. And that means that Sunday morning will start fairly grey, particularly around the coasts of England and Scotland, but also Northern Ireland. That humidity, of course, if you break through it, gives you a pretty hot afternoon, particularly in the lee of the hills. Here's the summary. Labour takes a battering at the ballot box. Within the last few minutes, Newcastle becomes the latest bastion to fall, but party figures put on a brave face. We take no one for granted, but it is by no means the beginning of the end uh, for this Labour government. Conservatives celebrate significant successes, including wins in urban areas where they'd previously been weak. I want a country in which people are big, but the state is small, the Liberal Democrats also make gains profiting from Labour's problems in its heartlands. And the next general election, I think, is going to be much more now a three-way national contest. And also coming up in this hour, America prepares to honour former President Ronald Reagan at his funeral in Washington. 
And a court hears the man accused of killing Caroline Dickinson carried a picture of the teenager in his wallet. Good afternoon. Labour have suffered heavy losses in the local council elections in England and Wales with the worst ever performance by a party in government. The Home Secretary David Blunkett said he was mortified that Labour wasn't doing better, but he insisted it was not meltdown for the party. Both the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats have made gains. Within the last few minutes, the Liberal Democrats have taken control of Newcastle from Labour. Well, our chief political correspondent, Gitta Harry, is at Westminster. Gitto. Yes, the Lib Dems are celebrating Newcastle. They're delighted with that. The Conservatives are celebrating taking a number of councils, though there's some sort of more sobering food for thought for them. But for Labour, there's very little consolation. It was a very bad night indeed. And all they can do is try and sort of put the best possible gloss on it, try and pretend that it could be somehow even worse and that, crucially, that it won't have an effect uh, next time uh, next year at the general election that we widely expect back then. What do they make of it? How do they deal with it all? Polly Billington has been following all the developments. A Tory leader with something to smile about. These crowds might not have been able to vote for him, but many that could did. And he's reaping the rewards. Conservatives have been winning seats and gaining control of councils at the expense of Labour and the Lib Dems. Uh, we had uh, excellent results uh, last night. Uh, we are now represented uh, up and down the country in the cities where we want to play an important part. Um, I've had a wonderfully enjoyable time at this school in Leicester this morning and uh, I'm about to go off to, uh, to Trafford where we had a notable victory last night. Trafford was once a shining example of Conservative rule in a northern city. It fell to Labour during the 90s. Getting it back suggests the Tories can make headway in urban areas in the north. But it could be the party's share of the vote is no greater than under William Hague in 2000, and we all know what happened to him. Labour lost out to the Liberal Democrats too. They've claimed the scalp of the leader of Newcastle City Council, which has been run by Labour since 1974. Devastated as far as the city is concerned. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we couldn't buck the national trend, I mean, that's quite clear. Uh, disappointed uh, that we've lost so many good councillors, uh, and indeed that I've lost my own position. Iraq may have been a factor in some Lib Dem successes like Burnley, and certainly one the Liberal Democrats made the most of. But in the South, they lost out to the Conservatives. This doesn't bode well for their chances of increasing the number of MPs at the general election, but they're upbeat. The next general election. I think is going to be much more now a three-way national contest with us having challenged and seen off the Conservatives in many parts of the South and the West. We're now taking the fight to Labour and beating them in their heartlands in the North. What MPs want to know from these results is what will happen to them. Will they get re-elected to come back to Westminster if there's a general election next year? Who will end up running the country? Now these local election results do not look good for Labour. But there's still a long way to go for the Conservatives before Michael Howard should book those removal men to put him into number 10. Polly Billington, BBC News, Westminster. Polly's right, of course. The main focus is on how the three main parties have fared and what we read into the local election results about their prospects for next year. But there are other parties, even here at Westminster, who are competing last night. And there are parties that are not even on the spectrum here, but nevertheless have something to celebrate overnight. Tim Wilcox reports on how the smaller parties fared. While the big parties battle it out over the first three places, some of the smaller ones are today quietly enjoying their own electoral successes. The Greens, seen here celebrating in Oxford, are already eight seats up nationally on their last result. Labour has now lost overall control of Oxford, but the Greens insist it was local, not national issues, that brought them success. We campaigned very much on local issues. We didn't put out leaflets saying vote green because we're anti-war. We, we put out leaflets on the issues uh, tackling and um, the, the local council on their poor record. And we won one seat from the Liberal Democrats, I mean, and three from Labour. So, so it wasn't all that we, we won from Labour. I think that's very much on local issues. And the UK Independence Party, which is predicted to do well when the Euro votes are counted on Sunday, has also made two gains. Its candidate in Hull taking his seat from an independent. But perceived as a single issue party, wasn't this just a protest vote? It's not just a protest vote. People are absolutely fed up with Europe. 
They know we've got policies on everything, not just Europe, and this is why they're giving us our, their support. In Wales, Plaid Cymru's been hoovering up more seats. They're up 11 so far, including inroads into Ceredigion. We've also made some interesting gains in places like Newport, Cardiff and Swansea, which we're overjoyed about. They might be small gains, but they are they do show the start of a breakthrough in the cities for Plaid Cymru, which is something that's vitally important for us. But there's been a reversal of fortune for the BNP in Burnley. Its share of the vote there has dropped by 10% and it made no breakthrough in Pendle. Voters' anger with the government hasn't filtered down to all the smaller parties. Tim Wilcox, BBC News. The best hope for Labour, of course, is that the worst is now behind them and that though there might be a few more blows in local government, they are hoping that there'll be a big victory for them here in London. A man that they chose to kick out of the party, Ken Livingstone, they brought him back into the party and probably this afternoon they'll feel hugely relieved that they did that. It looks close here in London, but that might be consolation. And on Sunday, not much probably for Labour to look forward to in the European election results, but they can at least look forward to perhaps the Conservative victories that Michael Howard was hoping for being actually tarnished somewhat by a rise in the UK Independence Party. It's a big, complicated picture, and we're going to be watching it for a few days yet. OK, Kitto, thanks very much. And of course, when we get any news from London on the London Mail, we'll bring you the results here on BBC News 24. We are now they're going to focus on Newcastle for what's being described as a stunning result for the Liberal Democrats. Now, let's just look at it there. The Liberal Democrats up 24 taking 24 seats from Labour. Now this will leave Labour worried. A stunning result is being described. Let's talk to our correspondent who's been watching all this. Mark Denton, he joins us live now from Newcastle. Right, take us through it. Well, basically, the start of today, there was a lot of optimism from Liberal Democrats saying, yes, we think we can probably become the largest party. We may just edge into control with a couple of seats. Well, we knew in the last half hour that the Liberal Democrats had taken control of this council and also by a pretty thumping majority as well for this part of the world. 48 seats for the Liberal Democrats, 30 seats for Labour, majority of 18. And I think it's fair to say that even the most optimistic Liberal Dem at the start this, uh, today would have said majority, perhaps, but not a majority of 18. 18 seats here. Uh, they're putting it down mainly to hard work. That's what their, their leader, Peter Arnold, has been saying up to us today. Also to the factor of the, uh, of the Gulf War, traditional Labour voting heartlands, not liking the fact that the Prime Minister's gone to war here. And of course, this is a traditional Labour area. This is a major council in the northeast of England that is now in the Lib Dems' hands. Now, it's interesting you should say, you should mention the war in this, because when we talk around the country, a lot of people are saying the war isn't really factoring, it's local issues. Local issues obviously factored as well. What were they? Well, there have been local issues as well. There's a major um, sort of housing um, plan of demolishing sort of lots of um, housing in part of the, the, the city centre of Newcastle. Substandard housing, uh, Labour calls it. They've got had a major policy to introduce this. The Liberal Democrats have disagreed with that policy. They want uh, an approach that is more gradual, and they'll be introducing that as uh, part of their policies as we go through. There have also been the sort of micro-local issues, if you like, parking charges, issues like that. But we come back again and again to those issues of what happens on the doorsteps, what are the big national issues, and I think it's fair to say there is a, a fair bit of bitterness from the, the Labour now opposition here that uh, a, a local government, a local council which just has next to no influence over Iraq and over the war there, the whole election here should be in a sense dominated by that particular issue, and that seems to be the thing that has turned the tide here, certainly according to Labour. Go to the Lib Dems and they will tell you it is street pounding, it is years of hard work over the last, uh, the last five years and more, connecting with the wards, connecting with the communities that has turned the tide so radically in this once Labour heartland. OK, and first reactions from Labour? Yes, I mean, there's some very, very sort of anguished um, sights today um, from Tony Flynn, who is the leader of the council, who of course lost his seat at this council today. Not only did he lose his seat, but his deputy, who shared the same ward with him, Keith Taylor, he lost his seat as well. And I think just uh, downstairs from here, we're looking at the council chamber behind me here, just outside here, uh, all the parties are milling around as you tend to get uh, after an election result. And basically, Labour look shell-shocked. They do not know what has hit them. They knew this would be close. They knew that it would be tough, but I don't think they thought that it could be as bad as it is this Friday lunchtime.
And the Liberal Democrats, of course, they're smiling. We've seen Charles Kennedy uh, most of the morning smiling, claiming it's uh, over at the country. It's a good victory for the Liberal Democrats. They must be delighted with this. They are absolutely cock a hoop with this. As early as about 9.30 this morning, as they started to count the ballot papers, we were seeing broad smiles on the faces of Liberal Democrat candidates. They knew that something was in the wind, and it was something more than just, uh, just eking control of this council. They knew that they were getting towards a situation where they were going to get a majority. Um, Charles Kennedy is in a plane now. He's winging his way up to the northeast of England. They're going to have a, a, a victory press conference on the steps of the City Hall here in New Newcastle and after all those other territories that have fallen to the Liberal Democrats they really see this council as a feather in their cap. Talking to Labour though they are uh, basically gritting their teeth they're saying that there were sort of local factors here to a certain extent but they're saying this is a protest vote really on the Iraq war and that it will pass they will recover and crucially in terms of a parliamentary election their MPs here in the city of Newcastle are safe. Mark thanks very much indeed. OK, let's bring you some breaking news, and it's not very good news coming out of the England camp in Portugal, and it is that John Terry has failed his fitness test this morning. That's according to our chief football correspondent, Mike Ingham, who's obviously out there in Portugal. So, question mark for, Sol, uh, for Sven Joran Eriksson about who is going to partner Sol Campbell in central defence there. Will it be Jamie Carragher? Will it be Ledley King? Uh, there's due to be a news conference that Sven and David Beckham are giving in the next half hour or so, and we hope to bring you that to you live here on on BBC News 24. Now, let us bring you more results uh, coming in. Let's go to Sean Lloyd in Cardiff now. Uh, Sean, um, Labour have lost Cardiff, uh, Monmouthshire, Tory gain. The, the Tories are coming back in Wales. Yes, uh, they're very pleased indeed about what they've been able to do in Monmouthshire. They said when they started out on this campaign that that was one of their ambitions to take Monmouthshire, of course, a very anglicised uh, region or a lot of people who live there, they commute to Bristol. There have been a lot of local issues in that area as well, especially about the closure of small schools. Um, also, the Conservatives were targeting the Vale of Glamorgan. It was a Conservative-led administration. There had been a number of by-elections there. They haven't been able to take over control in the Vale of Glamorgan but uh, they're very pleased with their, re with their result in Monmouthshire. Now we have just heard that uh, Labour have lost overall control of Cardiff City Council. That is going to be a huge blow to them. Uh, it was thought that it was going to be coming. There have been some recounts uh, this morning. There's still some counting left to do here in the Leisure Centre behind me but uh, we're told that that is not going to be able to save them. The Liberal Democrats have made huge ground in Cardiff. Of course they were all always a great uh, threat uh, against Labour there, especially in Cardiff Central. Now, the leader of Cardiff Council, Russell Goodway, was a very controversial figure. A lot of the campaigning had centred around his personality. Uh, obviously now uh, not clear what's going to happen in the future because the Liberal Democrats aren't saying too much at this stage. And can we say whether, again, this is a fact, this is the sort of Tony Blair paying for the Iraq war, or are there local factors that have played their part too? Well, one thing that Russell Goodway, the leader of Cardiff City Council, has done is he's come out with this very surprising outspoken attack, really, on the Welsh Assembly Government. He hasn't blamed the war in Iraq for what's happened in Cardiff anyway. What he's very much said is that uh, Labour supporters in Cardiff were incensed that the First Minister in the Assembly, Rodri Morgan, didn't go to France to commemorate D-Day. Uh, Russell Goodway is saying that Labour supporters were pulling out the posters from their windows and he He's blaming Roger Morgan and also the Welsh Assembly Government's record on health in Wales for their poor performance. OK, Sean, I didn't cut it. Thanks very much. Well, Tony Travers is a local government expert for the London School of Economics. He's with us in the studio. Let's just stay with Wales for a few seconds. The resurgence of the Tories in Wales. Why? Well, they've got a low base from which to start, really. I mean, the Conservative Party has had a difficult, really quite a long period in Wales. And if they are starting to build their way back in any numbers in Wales, it would be a, an enormously important sign, in some ways at least as important, as building back in urban England, which I, personally I'm less convinced about than by some commentators. But I think if they are beginning to will, build their way back in Wales, it's hugely important in terms of moving on to winning seats in a general election. 
The other big one we had was in the past few minutes, Liberal Democrats taking control in Newcastle. Now, a huge feather in the cap of the Liberal Democrats. There's there. no question at all that the Lib Dems' capacity to win in Newcastle, given that they've already won 11 seats in Manchester overnight, they held at Liverpool, and they are, in a sense, becoming the party of downtown urban England. It's going to be very interesting to see what next happens in Birmingham. Just looking at the figures of that on the screen, which have, as I say, have come in within the past few minutes. Why is that? Why are they becoming that party? Why are they attractive to the urbanites? Well, I think what's probably happening is that for many, many years in these big cities, Labour's been the only offer and eventually the electorate looks around for some way of voting non-Labour. And for many Labour voters, voters liber voting Liberal Democrat is more attractive. They then attract Conservative voters as well, who realise they're never going to win themselves. And somehow the Liberal Democrats punch through. But in the Newcastle result, it's a big step. Mm. It's in one go and they've gone right the way through to power. And uh, there will be enormous celebration, I can imagine, at Lib Dem headquarters about this one. It is a big one, there's Lots no question. Lots of questions at Labour headquarters, I would have thought. Uh, Tony, we'll be back with you later. Thank okay. you for the moment. OK, time now. It's 16 minutes past one. Our headline so far today. Labour has suffered heavy losses in the local elections. They have lost control of eight councils, Newcastle and Cardiff are the latest bastions to fall. Well, the Conservatives have made significant wins. They've won their first council in Wales for some years and overall they've gained more than 120 councillors. Liberal Democrats have at least matched their best ever performance, although they were pushed hard by the Tories in some areas.